Bright Minds, the podcast from the John Adams Institute, is brought to you by the members of the John Adams. Why not become a member yourself, or even better, a patron, and enjoy all the extras and benefits? Find out more at john-adams.nl, john-adams.nl, and click on Become a Member. From Amsterdam, this is Bright Minds, the podcast from the John Adams Institute, a treasure trove of the best and the brightest of American thinking. And when it comes to the relationship between information overload and depression, our next speaker has a theory. My theory is you only have to know about the, really, the people next door to you. Like if the woman next door to me is having sex with the man next door to her. I have to know that. Yeah, of course. But, yeah. but four doors down, yeah. I shouldn't care. <laughs> I should let it go. Let it go. But Ruby Wax found it hard to let go, and that's why this wildly successful actress, writer, and comedian wrote a book about it called Sane New World back in 2013. Now, if you don't know Ruby Wax's name, that's because even though she's American, her career has been largely in the UK. But you may be aware of a little show called Absolutely Fabulous in which she both acted and served as script editor. Despite her success, she's been open about her struggles with depression. She even went so far as to get a degree from Oxford on mindfulness through cognitive behavioral therapy. Hence, Sane New World. The book is based on personal experiences and achieves the rare feat of addressing mental illness while being both readable and funny. Wax says the world is moving too fast for the human mind to keep up and that we need to be easier on ourselves. After all, we'd never dream of treating our pets the way we treat ourselves, she says. This interview was recorded back in November of 2013, and you can hear that Ruby was speaking in a big, echoey space throughout the recording. But, you know, it's interesting, fun. It's also very insightful. So we thought we had to share it with you. So here's the Dutch writer and journalist Ellen de Bruyne, who took on the task of interviewing the delightfully chaotic and insightful Ruby Wax. I never told anybody I had depression. P.S. It has nothing to do with being in show business. It's one in four people in the world. So if it was like, one, two, three, four, it's you. <laughs> so it's one in four. So I never told anybody, but then Comic Relief, do you know Comic Relief? They asked if they could t use my picture for a, a, a mental illness charity. And I said, okay. And I thought it was going to be really tiny. But instead, they put a gigantic poster of me in the tube station that said, this woman has mental illness. Please help her. <laughs> So I was mortified, and I, I hurled myself in front of it. But then it turned out they were everywhere, all over London. So I thought, this is true. I thought, you know what? I'm going to write a show and make that look like it's my publicity poster. <laughs> so I did. And uh, otherwise, I never would have done this. Then I toured mental institutes, mental institutions for, for two years. And, uh, well, I say in the show that... If you can make a schizophrenic laugh, you're halfway to Broadway. <laughs> and then I had many more. But they, they loved the show, I think. They weren't always facing me. But, um, <laughs> but they loved it. And then I have another line, but, you know. I say that my favorite line, do you mind me saying it, was that I used to collect my favorite line because these people were extraordinary. And uh, my favorite was I was in a men's lock-in, you know, high security for, you know, the big boys psychopaths. And so I was standing next to my husband and this man came over and he said, I'm your biggest fan. Which one of you is Ruby Wax? <laughs> so that was that one. Anyway, so then I took the show to real theaters with normal people, <laughs> whatever that is. And, uh, and it's been to Australia and to Cape Town and to America and to, where am I going? Boston next week. Oh, that's in America. So, um, so I, uh, it, I, tra I traveled all over, and then in the second half of the show, the audience get to ask questions. Um, and so I noticed that the whole audience would ask questions that weren't that far off from the mental institutions. So I thought, well, I'll write a book, not for the one in four, but for the four in four, because we all seem to have the same plumbing, uh, and we all have those voices, those critical voices, 
that, um, you know, you got her, you got her, you didn't, you screwed up. Nobody ever in any of my shows, and maybe there's here somebody tonight who could prove me wrong, has a voice that says, what a wonderful thing I'm doing here, and may I say how attractive I am today. <laughs> Maybe there's somebody, but so that's why I wrote the book, because then I researched what is our malaise as human beings rather than the, the mentally ill. So the first part of the book is for the normal mad, and then there's a short chapter on the mad band, because I have to include my people, and then I go on to explain how the brain works mm -hmm. in a moronic kind of, you know, translator from the real brilliant men to the moron, you know, so I'm good at making it bite size and flipping it into being humorous, otherwise... What's the point of me? And then at the end, I tell you how to regulate, or what's known in, as far as brain research, how you can regulate your own brain. Because in a minute, you won't be able to afford a therapist or medication, so it's got to be the next zeitgeist. So that's why I was interested. Finished. <laughs> so. Next question. Well, thank you for that. So yeah. we've, we're finished Cleared with the topic of, of your depression. No, I don't head. mind. I could discuss it for years. Okay. But well, it, just so you know, it's not in, it'll, it's yeah, not in this yeah, book. Yeah. My, oh, it's a little in this it's book. It's a little in this yeah. book. It's, it's, uh, it's just short of 30 pages, I think. Yeah, 25. 25. Yeah. 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 Because um, I am the poster girl for mental illness yeah, in England. Yeah, you are. Did, were you in time with that show? Did, did you make the show, the show while the posters were still hanging there in the tube stations? Or, uh, uh, no, I made my own poster, but it was not dissimilar to that one. That's great. It was like a That's Prozac lovely. in my mouth, and I was going, Wow. Which was the poster. That's great. Yeah, it's great. Um, so basically, you think we are all mad. We are the four and four. Uh, no, I don't say we're all mad. Okay. I just say there is no normal. And. <laughs> Not especially you. Um, oh, thank you. No, because you've got a grin on your face. Yeah, it's just I know. stuck there, yeah. Um, I was just relieved. I know. Um, I'm not saying everybody's mad. I'm just saying maybe hundreds of years ago, people knew their place. You know, I was a peasant. There was a king. You know, mm. my life was to, you know, breed and plow and die. Shit happens. But now we believe in entitlement mm -hmm. that we can have everything. You know, because the newspapers and magazines say, come on, come on, they're tempting you. Anybody could have anything. And so it always leads to heartbreak. This is why there are girls who want to be supermodels, you know, with those red blood nails with the diamantes. And they don't, they ignore the fact that they're the size of Tibet, you know, and people who want to go on the X Factor who have the talent of a toothpick. Everybody wants it, wants it, wants it. And mm. we're made, you know, we're lured by this kind of piece of meat that we can have it all. So we've tipped over. You know, we aren't satisfied with our lot. It's yeah. not our fault. It's just the way things are. Basically, we're not fit to live in the 21st century. No, that's what my book is. Yeah, yeah. we're not, we're not, we're not uh, equipped to deal with the 21st century because it's too fast and it's too hard and it's too full of fear. I just think we don't have the bandwidth. So I'm not complaining about it. It's a fantastic thing. But also, uh, we have to realize we have to pull the brakes because it's not going to. So it's understanding what happens in our brains that, you know, evolution meant well, but it didn't know we were going to go this far. Mm -hmm. You know, it didn't know that uh, suddenly we'd have incoming from everywhere at the flip of a button because our brain can't tell the difference if there's a predator right behind us or there's some danger 20,000 miles away. So... That's why we're in a constant state of alarm because it's in, you know, I need to know that there's an earthquake in Thong 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 <laughs> or a shark attack in Malawi. Why do I need to know this? I'm I mean, really I, my, my theory is you only have to know about the, really, the people next door to you. Like if the woman next door to me is having sex with the man next door to her, I have to know that. Yeah, of course. But, yeah. but four doors down, yeah. I shouldn't care. <laughs> I should let it go. Let it go. I mean, you know, why, unless you're going to go to, you know, wherever there's dead brain, Nebraska, with, you know, because they've had a flood with a bucket and a hand pump, shut up, you know, do something about it. And, so, but our brain is still wired but to our, worry about that. Yeah, it's still incoming. It's being bombarded all the time. Yeah, and, and we, not, we do not only worry about uh, those earthquakes on the other side of the world, but we also worry about ourselves. We have these critical voices all the time in our heads. But there's a reason why you have the critical voices. Why do we have the critical voices? Yeah, this is what um, I learned at university, and some of this I'm making up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have the critical voices because... Um, 
you know, when we were still in the bush with the body hair, we were always vigilant like every other animal, you know, looking around. You know how your cat looks around? It's always waiting for bad news, otherwise it would be eaten by the next incoming predator. So it's always looking, well, well language came online about 20, well, 50,000 years ago. We, we had those sensations, but we put words to it. So it's translating the sensation of, oh my God, oh, oh look out, you know, I've, I'm gonna get killed. Even, um, even, you're a failure, which is one of my themes. Uh, people are going to find out you're a fraud. It's meaning well. You know, it wants you to kind of straighten up and fit in with the rest of the herd. I mean, my mother used to say, not that everybody has the voice of their mother, but it doesn't help. Mm. My mother used to say, I'm telling you you are a moron because I'm your mother and I love you. <laughs> so, um, you know, some of us, even your parents, they meant well. You know, don't suck on the dog spoon. You know, don't put your finger in a socket. They meant well, but it leaves us in a kind of state of slight paranoia because evolution doesn't care about your happiness. It only cares about your survival. Mm. So we have this button in our heads called the amygdala, which is our alarm system. It never comes down. Mm. It never shuts down. And when that's up, the voices are really incoming. So some of us really obey, you know, those voices going, do this, do this, got to do. I mean, I wake up in the morning with a to-do list, like, <gasps> buy shampoo. <laughs> you know, declaw the cat with more urgency than Obama has when he's deciding whether to bomb Syria. <laughs> Buy cat, go to dry cleaner. You know, it's just, it's endless. Yeah. Voices, yeah. But everybody has it. Ask them. Do you have that? Is there anybody without those without voices? Without a shopping list. Could, could they please stand up? I okay. think you're right. Yeah. I think this proves you're right. Well, otherwise you'd be a mushroom. You know, so you need, we need a certain amount of stress. It's just yeah. that we don't know our tipping point. Mm. And so people are burning out more than they ever did, I think. Yeah, yeah. But that has nothing to do with depression. <laughs> Let's just keep that in a box. That's, that's another, that's the, the... That's a whole nother world, yeah. The normal way of, of being a bit mad. And depression is the, is the one in four, so... Yeah, yeah. I mean, de depression is like... The illness, the an illness that It's has an illness. really very little to do with stress. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you 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 made a study of psychology and of mindfulness, and uh, that's how you sort of uh, came to uh, write a manual of the brain in this book. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's. Well, it's one of the most humorous texts about the, the human brain I've ever read. It's a sort of mixture of comedy and... and uh, accuracy. Accuracy, thank you. <laughs> um, and why do you think that people uh, never write with humor about the brain? Because I don't think it's ever been done before. I've read quite a lot about mm. the brain. I don't think it would occur to somebody to do that. I, don't, I, I think it's unusual for somebody who's a comedy writer to go back to school and then study the brain. I think that might be peculiar, Yeah. but um, I suddenly got overwhelmed with an interest in it. I mean, I was studying psychology at Berkeley, but then you couldn't look into a live brain, you could only look in a corpse, and that's of no interest. Yeah. But 10 years ago, you could actually take a brain scanner and watch how somebody thinks, and I thought, this is way more interesting than psychotherapy, because I want the real meat. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't like fluffy things. You know, I want to look at, if I can smell it or look at it or taste it, then it's real. Okay, call me crazy. If somebody asks me what my star sign is, I'm going to offend everybody, I go, I smile politely and say, we should get together, but really I'm crossing their name out of my address book. <laughs> I can't really. That We're 2013 and people are still buying books about hugging your inner elf. Thank you, person. <laughs> what, do, what sign are you? Fuck. <laughs> Probably an Aquarius. So you know, it's it, it it science and research know all this stuff. For some reason, it's not coming down to us. We're just getting, you know, the information about how to dance with a whale. So um, so I thought, oh, well, I'm going to go to school and find out because in my lifetime, I'd like to know about why my brain does this. So then I thought, yeah. well, I'll find I'll find out from research what are the best what are the best methods of getting down the cortisol, you know, controlling it yourself because. Here's something else I don't think a lot. There's neuroplasticity. It isn't, um, you know, Sleeping Beauty. It isn't some new, it, it, it does exist. We now know that this is very malleable. You can change your brain by how you think. I mean, they can actually look in and see a vast number of neurons. When you do a habit over and over again, same thing, or you think the same way, they lock in. And so 
they wire together. And so it's not really your personality, it's your habits. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm always aggressive and it works for me, I'm going to always take the, you know, this. It's not who I am. It's just I got in the habit of it. It's like smoking. But um, now they know that if you intentionally uh, realize that you're caught in that habit and you just hold it back a little bit and notice it, when you notice it, it starts to unwire. And then you form new habits that maybe are a little more beneficial and make you more flexible. But this isn't something I learned on a weekend. Mm. This is actually what's going on. So with that kind of hope, I thought, I can rewire myself because my wiring is screwed. I thought, well, I'll, I'll find out how you do this. So the results were I didn't look for it. You know, I wasn't interested in mindfulness or cognitive therapy. I hadn't been studying it, but those have the best results. Yeah. So I thought, okay, I'll study that. So I went to Mark Williams, who was the founder of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, and, and he said, uh, he told me about it, and, but I said, I want to know what happens in the brain. And he said, well, unfortunately, you'll have to get into Oxford. <laughs> and so I have a lot of dopamine and adrenaline. So that was my next mission. It was like a Rottweiler with a piece of, you know, bone in front of it. So I found some grades that were okay, you know, and I crossed out my SAT scores, which were that of a house plant. I think I said that on the college, so <laughs> terrible. And so, but I give really good interview, believe it or not. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So I got into Oxford, and then uh, when, I, when I got there, all these the people in my class looked at me like I was an encounter with a third kind, <laughs> but I was in, you know, so I became really fascinated. That, but in the, my course, you didn't just study the brain, you had to learn how to regulate the brain, and so I found mindfulness really interesting. Is it about thinking different thoughts, like choosing your thoughts, or is it is it someone else that uh, something else that interested you? It, you uh, you just spoke about neuroplasticity. Is that basically uh, learning to think different thoughts than you were used to think? Or well, if you could do that, you wouldn't have to do anything. You know, like just go. Oh, I wish I could think different thoughts. Yeah, that'll end you in a mental institution. <laughs> So, uh, it, it, you, do you want me to explain what it is? I mean, it, it yeah. is. It's not so. Um, it's not so out of this world. It's actually pretty technical, but you have to practice it, and that's a bitch because everybody wants a pill and it's over. Mm -hmm. So it's like going to a gym. You can't do one sit up and you got a six pack. So unfortunately, <laughs> we have to work at this. But I mean, in England, when I got there, you know, everybody's in a gym now five days a week. Mm -hmm. When I got to England, people weren't even brushing their teeth. <laughs> yeah. And now everybody, people need it. They go to work. They need a six pack because they're going to do a Lynx commercial in the afternoon. I don't understand. <laughs> so, you know, so with the brain now, this is the thing that'll kill you. This will make you live longer. You can run as much as you want. It'll, you know, obviously it might be good for you. I mean, you, you need, you need aerobics, but you, it's not going to, it doesn't stop aging, and it doesn't stop senility. Whereas if you really keep your mind flexible, you know, and, and keeping, I'm not talking about Alzheimer's because that is a disease again. Mm -hmm. You know, this is again like somebody saying, does depression apply to people in show business? So cooling down the, the engines. Yeah, yeah. And the can be done by this mindfulness. That's, that's, is that where I was going? Yeah. Tell me, I, I drifted off. That, but, but, I fell asleep for a minute. Sorry. No, I didn't. But how do you practice it? What, what do you do? Okay, so, you know, when you have those nagging voices, they're on all the time, most of the time. You know, sometimes we have a moment's peace, but usually they're on. You're never going to shut them off. If your mind is empty, you're dead, okay? So if you see nothing up there, you better start finding some shovels because you're dead. So what you do is the thoughts go in front of you. Let me see if I can explain this well. This, they're still going, but there's a part of your brain that you can take a back seat and watch them. Just go along with me on this. So they, they're not like, you're not in the slipstream of go get the shampoo, go get that. We used to believe that. Oh, I must get that. And then you become a fanatic. If you sort of watch them, you, you start to notice that they, they're more like the weather, that they, something is so important. But actually, if you're just watching, it goes, and you notice it's like traffic. It goes, there's heavy ones, there's angry ones, there's light ones. And that's not all you do, though, but you notice that maybe it's not something solid. Same with feelings. Mm -hmm. If you really go in and feel, you know, where is, why am I, do I feel love or pain or whatever, you, you go in rather than run away and you realize it changes. But the way you, uh, the actual method you use, uh, let me just say it's not about vegging out, you know, that you just sit there and watch your thoughts because 
the ones of us who really do well. We have those brains that go on turbo, you know, and we really, you really want to chew over, over a problem or you want to create. That's the best we can be as human beings. That's at our best when we're, you know, making the world a better place to live in or we're, we're coming up with something that gives us pleasure. But the, again, we don't know the tipping point where it's no longer good for us. It actually backfires and you trip up on yourself and you burn out. And you have different kinds of thinking, which we're not even aware of. There's rumination, where you try to answer questions like, why does, why did my boyfriend leave me? Why am I too fat? Not hot enough, not, you know. We'll never answer that. So that's another type. Then there's mind wandering. Uh, that's some Harvard research said we spend 47% of our time mind wandering and it isn't, to, and we're not really happy doing it. it. Makes you miserable. So, with the mindfulness, you can kind of choose, like say, I don't want to be mind wandering. I don't want to finish another book and get to the end and think, what did I just read? So the idea of mindfulness is it, it, it exercises your attention. It helps you focus on what you want to focus on, just like, you know, muscles in your, and it helps you take the focus to where you want to be. So it's, everybody says, what do you mean attention? I pay attention. I go, oh yeah, well eat a piece of chocolate, okay? You tasted it the first bite. By the third bite, you're somewhere in Czechoslovakia. You know, people are gone. You know, you tell kids to pay attention. They don't know what it means. So our minds are used to going into the future, into the past, and on. That's how we're, it's our habit. And it's to keep us, again, going. But nature didn't give us the braking system. We have to learn that, like you mm. have to learn calculus. So the practice you do in order to do that, and it's, it's unbelievably physical, is that when you notice the, there's too much incoming, right? That's because your amygdala is on. That's it. Plain and simple. The amygdala is on. Your cortisol levels are up and the voices really go because you're agitated and you're trying to figure out what should I do? Where should I go? But there's another part of your brain, which you can see in a brain scanner. You don't have to buy it on Amazon that we all have, which is, and you, and you, you're using it. You're using that part of the brain when you feel like you have a stomach ache or a pain in your foot or you trip on your toe. It's interception. It's where you feel inside or you feel the chair that it's uncomfortable or you feel your clothes, you know, that they're itchy. That's your insula. The minute you send attention to something physical, like really listening, there really is sound. It's not your imagination. There really is the feel of, you know, your seat on the seat. There really is a feel. Whenever you send that attention into your body to something specific, the amygdala automatically goes down. So if the insula is working, the voices get quieter. The insula isn't working, the voices get... It's like a car that can't be in two gears at once and you can still drive it. So in a sense, it's, you're sort of tricking your brain. That's what you can see in a scanner, and that's probably what happens with cognitive therapy, is that you're thinking about thinking, and then the voices take over. And that exercise, even if you do it a few minutes a day, is strengthening this insula so that when the shit really hits the fan, you can kind of maybe anchor down and let, let it go over you a little bit. You, you can't just do it in case there's an emergency. So just for when I'm waiting for a bus or when I'm waiting, you know, when you're doing nothing, instead of looking at your watch, because that won't make time go any faster, strangely. You know, sometimes I just say, where am I? <laughs> it really is going, okay, I'm standing on my feet. I'm focused on this, or I'm listening. And you just watch how your mind grabs you back. You think, well, what am I thinking? Usually I'm thinking, I gotta write another email, another email, another email. You just notice it, and instead of giving yourself a hard time, because that's where the voices come in, we start being stressed about stress. And somebody says it's like sending in another arrow. You mm -hmm. weren't in pain enough. Now you have to really give it to yourself. And there's an expression, pain is pain, but suffering is optional. <laughs> so you learn to not add the layer of fear on fear. You just watch it, you go, okay, it's what I'm thinking. That's okay, this is the hard part. And then you go back to just feeling the ground, you know, feeling your feet on the ground. Or eating, you really taste it. Or reading a book, you really read the book. And you just do that a little bit. You can't do that all day. You'll go nuts. And don't do it while you're driving because you'll crash the car. But just a few minutes a day means that when you go, it's like a recharging a battery. You bring the cortisol down. They can see that when somebody is doing this kind of thing. It comes down, the amygdala comes down, and then when you need your power back, you can go much faster than anybody else because you don't have the red mist in your head. 
you know, this is another thing that I don't understand why people don't know. When you're stressed, you're not just stressed. You're killing neurons in the hippocampus, a part of your brain where you store memory. And that's why when kids are taking an exam and they're stressed, they go blank. You are rendered an idiot when you're stressed. So people that go to meetings and they think they're having a meeting and now they've locked antlers, they're not going to make any more sense. And we should learn to hold up a white flag and say, I'm completely screwed. I'll see you in 10 minutes. But, you know, we think, okay, I'm getting angrier and angry and we infect each other. You know, like if I get nervous, you'll get nervous. It's like neural Wi-Fi. It goes right through the room. So if I can, if I can bring down my, if I can bring it down, those, those, those hormones, you'll feel a lot better. It's, it's a really remarkable thing how they watch how somebody in a scanner affects the next person in it because we have those mirror neurons. So It's contagious. So it's conta are contagious. We're yeah. contagious, yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, if you I'm, were getting uptight, I would start to really get yeah. nervous. So yeah. there's different things I could do. I could either call it or, you know, do something mm -hmm. to cool you down, just something. Mm -hmm. Once you understand the state of somebody else, you can do something about it, but usually you're too busy thinking, God, they hate me. <laughs> they just think I'm an idiot. And yeah. we're all locked into this kind of, you know, um, the worst reviews you will ever give yourself are from yourself. You know, I mean, worst yeah. reviews you'll yeah. ever get. Nobody is as mean to ourselves as we are. And uh, you, you just said it's, it's very hard to practice it because you probably, uh, you start popping out all the time and you start... Oh, you hate it. it. It's just horrible. But it's horrible to do a sit-up too. Yeah. Especially when you're, out of, when you're out of shape. Yeah. You got to go, oh, God, I've got to do it. So it's, it's hard to sit there. You're waiting for a bus and just to go, okay, I'm just going to hear sound or I'm going to taste this grape all the way to when I swallow it. That already is doing unbelievable things physiologically in your brain. That's what you have to understand. Yeah. It's not just, you're not just eating. There's neurons that are wired together, and just by observing them, the neurons unwire. And that's how you keep a really resilient brain. And do you uh, visualize that while eating the grape, for example? Or no, because be... then you're back in your head. What yeah. you want to do is, when you, you can't think and have sense at the same time. Mm -hmm. The minute you're sensing something, That's why I like scuba diving, because I can feel the water, and my brain goes into, I'm just one with the fish. You're actually in the presence, in the present. Yeah, yeah. And that's something none of us know how to do. It, it happens by accident. Yeah. You know, when you're suddenly, you see a picture, or you see, you're suddenly there, but we visit it by accident. So mm. this is a real way, if you want to make it one of your, a repertoire in your destinations, you can't taste a grape yesterday or tomorrow. You can only do it right now. So I say this in the book. Sometimes I'm with my kids and I miss their childhood completely. They say, what was I like at four? And I go, well, you were short. <laughs> I have no idea because I was, I couldn't get off the telephone. It was an, they thought I had earmuffs, you know, made out of metal and I couldn't get off. And uh, I, sometimes I'd fake it. Like one, I swear this is true. I had a speaker when I w pretended to be Santa with a beard. So they couldn't see the speaker. Well, they did catch me. Um, and so I thought, well, I can't miss any more of this. So with this practice, 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 sometimes I can get that lid down of the computer and then really focus and hear them. And they can tell now I can hear them. And I can remember what they're saying. So I sort of did it for my kids because I didn't want to miss any more of my life. Because if you think 50% is spent mind wandering, mm. that means 50% you're not alive. Yeah. You know, so... I'm surprised that mind wandering wouldn't be more positive. What? Well, mind wandering. If you if you just say the word, it sounds like such a positive thing. You're just sitting there and do, doing a bit of daydreaming. But you need all of this isn't. Ex I, I'm making it sound. You need stress. Otherwise, you don't you don't put the gear in. Mm. You need mind wandering. But it's when you get lost in it, mm, yeah. and then you, like three days have gone by, and you say, <laughs> "How did I get here?" Obviously, you missed something. Yeah. So it does when they do ask people it does make them miserable because they yeah. don't know where they were <laughs> and this is the difference uh, uh, between the doing mode and the being mode as you call it yeah but book? that's too fluffy you know okay. i mean I, i know what it means yeah doing is when you're in full drive turbo which is a good place to be yeah but again if you go too much yeah i can't you know these people that like jog at five o'clock in the morning and they work 77 hours a day and i think god i must be such an idiot 
because I can't jog it. You know, I can't jog at eight o'clock at night. Mm. So we're always giving ourselves more yeah. of a hard time. Like I'm so angry. I'm not blonde and tall like you. <laughs> well, and you have to be here at eight o'clock tonight, so you couldn't jog. Uh, no, that's but really also the fact that. I think, you know, you've got things going that I don't. That, of course, it's going through, but I'm not going to act on it as I would have many years ago. I would have clawed your eyes out. Well, thank you. <laughs> so see how evolved I am now? I'm so happy about that. Yeah. And also, um, part of the, 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 the neurons locking you into habits is that you see people the way... Um, they're a reflection of your memory. Like every time, we don't see somebody for the first time. If I look at somebody, I'll go back into the kind of file of facts of who you remind me of, because that's how we work. Are you safe or should I mate with you? <laughs> it's pretty much what we're distinguishing. So, we, so actually you're holding somebody ransom to your first impression, and you lock them in. I mean, our minds are bigots. So um, what you want to do is, you know, break, break that that narrowness open and the only way to do is to kind of question it to say wait a minute wait a minute you got this person wrong this is just my habit that's actually not you know I married my husband because he had the eyebrows of Jeff Bridges and then I realized he wasn't really Jeff you know yeah I knew there was some reason I liked him so what did you do well I kept him because yeah. you know Jeff was too old but <laughs> you know people say 10 years after they get married oh that wasn't the person I thought they were Well, they never were. Yeah. 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 <laughs> does this make sense? It, it does, yeah. I'm just thinking of Jeff Bridges now, but I'm not you know how getting you myself those, those kind of cute eyebrows. So I married my husband because he had those, you know, I thought I know. I'm attracted to Ed. I, it was Jeff. <laughs> It's okay. He's not here. He's not going to know. <laughs> I've never told him, so don't, don't call my house. Are we putting this on the internet? Oh, fuck. <laughs> Is it on the internet? I don't know, actually. No, it can't be. It'll ruin my relationship okay, at home. Okay, well, maybe we can cut this part out. Um, there's a, you also give an alternative in your book, for, or, or several alternatives, for people who don't want to practice mindfulness or who don't think it's for them. Yeah, because uh, it, it isn't for everybody. It isn't for everybody. No. Who isn't it for? Well, who somebody who, you know, I don't like yoga, because I don't see the point of kissing my behind from both directions. <laughs> But other people think it's fantastic. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, we, we have taste. I don't like, you yeah. know. So say somebody really finds it irritating to listen or they don't want to follow their own breathing because mm. it's too spooky. So then they can do cognitive therapy. I talk about that. Where you work with somebody and start to see, is this the way I always react? Yeah. Or is this really the, the rea is this really the truth? Yeah. You know, if yeah. A, they always say, if a friend, if a person goes by and you say hi and they ignore you, if you think every time it's because they hate my guts, it's probably coming from your head. Yeah. And then yeah. some people say, oh, she just didn't see me. Well, they don't need mindfulness or anything because they're well adjusted. <laughs> But if you keep thinking, you know, well, she hates my guts you know, and she doesn't want to speak, which I would, hmm. then we need help. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, and cognitive therapy is where you write that down. You write down, this happened, but, I felt this. Yeah, and you, and you say, I felt it 90%. And when you actually analyze, well, maybe there are other possibilities. Maybe she was busy. Maybe she had something to do. Then you start again opening the neurons. There's other possibilities. Yeah. Rather yeah. than saying, no, I'm, that's what my father was crazy. No, nope, I'm right. That's the way it is. Or I walk. Yeah. You know, that's the way the world is. Yeah. That's a sign of madness. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, did you try the cognitive therapy? Was it, it, it wasn't for you? Or yeah, yeah no, uh, I, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Yeah. So it was both. So you do parts of it and... Uh, yeah, they swing between yeah. the two. Yeah. But I wanted to do mindfulness because you don't have to pay a shrink because I got sick of that. Yeah. I have no money left. I've given it. To the psychiatric world. And now you're your own shrink? Now, one? well, I do, you do what a shrink would do, which is when you're with a shrink, you throw your crap at them. You know, you tell them what's in your mind. And because they contain you and they're compassionate, you forgive yourself. They're like the mommy that yeah. you always wanted. Yeah. And so you think, oh, well, maybe everybody's like this. Maybe this isn't so bad. And that kind of, again, unlocks that, that hard locking, that wiring. And that's what a shrink pretty much does. It doesn't matter what technique they're using. Yeah. So with mindfulness, there is, you are, you know, part of you is watching the crap, but then you're learning to kind of be kind. Don't give myself a hard time. Of course, that's what I think. It's okay. Go back to the anchor. 
The reason you need the anchor is if you keep listening to your mind, you'll get caught again. And an anchor the anchor is like the breath or the... Or you're feeling your you're behind. Then yeah. it's going to pull you up. You're going to watch. You need to know how you think. And you say, oh, I'm in that theme again. I'm in that everybody hates me theme. I'm in that. Okay, this time I'm not going to give myself a hard time. It's just my theme song. Down you go again. And then it'll pull you up and then down. Otherwise, with the shrink, you're throwing your garbage at them. They're absorbing it. Mm. Now you've got to go somewhere. Otherwise, you'll get caught again. Yeah. God, I hate myself. And you know why I hate myself? Because I'm too fat. And you know why I'm too fat? Because I ate too much at dinner. And then at dinner, oh, God, I should have fed my dog. I didn't feed my dog. Maybe I should get another car. And that will go on for 300 years. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so basically you, you've learned to be your own good mother, to be a good mother to yourself. Well, even when I hear my mother's voice, which now I do forgive my mother, yeah. because she must have had real screaming in her head, because yeah. how we scream at ourselves is how we treat other people. If there's screaming going on, you're going to give it the next person hell because you think that's how you see the world. Yeah. Your thoughts really indicate how you see the world. Now, yeah. Again, the, the, the horror is that you have to know that. You have to see what you're thinking. But if you don't look in, it's there anyway. You mm -hmm. know how people are passive-aggressive? Or um, people who do the triathlon and think they can outrun their, de their demons? Well, someday they have to put their gym shoes up, and then it'll really hit them. So better to know the devil early and kind of, you know, say, okay, everybody's like this. Everybody's as screwed as you are. And that's the only way I can forgive myself. How about Is that we... bad? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Okay, that's, good. That's... Okay, it would mean my whole book was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Ruby Wax in conversation with the Dutch writer and journalist Ellen de Bruyne about her book, Same New World. Ms. Wax put show business aside for the most part when she became a visiting professor in mental health nursing at the University of Surrey, and she was appointed Chancellor of the University of Southampton in 2019. Did you know that you can go to our website, john-adams.nl slash videos, where there's a link to the video of this event, we also have a newsletter you can sign up for and a veritable treasure trove of great American thinkers and speakers at john-adams.nl. And while you're there, why not become a member of the John Adams? Not only do you support what we do here at the podcast, you get a discount to future live events. In the meantime, go to wherever you get your podcasts, review this show. This will help get the word out and we can keep on sharing the very best of American thinkers in Amsterdam with you free of charge. That's it for this week's show. Our theme song is called La Prensa by the Parlandos. Our editor is Tracy Metz. From Amsterdam, this was Bright Minds, the podcast from the John Adams Institute. I'm Jonathan Gubert. Thank you for listening.